up. All right. Welcome, 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 everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we are in another session of the of uh, the, the community table. I almost <laughs> I got I got got a little bit of a hiccup there, um, but uh, we are. And thank you for joining us for today's session here. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, uh, thank you so much for joining us here. If you're joining, watching the replay, thank you for watching the replay. I appreciate uh, taking the time. Hopefully you get some, uh, some, some insights out of this. Uh, if you are watching the replay, make sure that you ask any questions that you might have throughout this. Uh, you can go ahead and ask them in the comments of either YouTube or on Facebook. Uh, we'll be monitoring those and, uh, and I will be making sure that if they, as they do come up, that I will, uh, I'll, we'll send them to Dean and we'll make sure to get the, get those answered as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're excited for this uh, for this conversation today. This discussion around building a message that actually uh, that actually makes an impact for people. So um, <clears throat> with that, we'll uh, we'll officially kick things off and say good afternoon. Uh, and we appreciate you joining us for today's community table discussion. Uh, this is um, this one is crafting your message. Uh, all focused around how to use your story to get people to take notice and to take action. Uh, my name is Ian Campbell. I am the CEO of Mission Suite. And joining me as always here is Dean Isaacs, founder and CEO of Vantage Group. Uh, Dean's a serial entrepreneur with over 20 years of uh, hands-on business growth, sales, and marketing experience. He works with business-to-business -business companies across the U.S. that range from startups to the Fortune 500. And he loves helping small and mid-sized businesses achieve their growth goals by developing and implementing high-impact sales, marketing, and growth strategies. So, Dean, as always, thanks for, for being here again. It's always a pleasure, Ian. Thanks for having me on again. And I probably need to take the content of today's webinar and redo that intro, right? You're right. <laughs> it's well, I mean, you know, we, we talked about examples that we could use for, for this afternoon. So maybe, yeah, exactly. maybe, maybe. There's, a, there's a before example. Maybe we'll come up with the after example. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, but uh, for anybody who's wondering, Dean and I did not call each other and coordinate our shirts before we uh, before we got on this. Purely accidental, uh, but, you know, we're both in our offices, so there's limited, <laughs> limited right. opportunities to yeah. make things different. It's a Wednesday afternoon uniform, blue collared shirts, right? Exactly, right, right, for sure. <laughs> Um, all right. So before we jump into the full conversation here, uh, I do want to address a couple of housekeeping items as I, as I usually do. You know, this is for the for the people that are joining us live. Uh, we are taking questions throughout the session today. And at the end, of course, we'll have some we'll, we'll probably have some time for Q&A. But if you have questions, uh, you know, just let us know uh, as they come up. Right. I mean, don't wait for the Q&A at the end. Go ahead and uh, and, and use that Q&A button excuse me, use that Q&A button in your Zoom screen <clears throat> to, uh, to ask the question so that we can make sure to kind of keep everything siloed inside of that Q&A so that we can kind of, we, we can monitor that appropriately. Um, so, but definitely uh, as, you, uh, as, you, as, you, as you think of questions, if there's anything that you wanna do, let us know. And uh, if you, as we're going through this, if you want to even have uh, Dean and I kind of talk about your own personal kind of pitch, right? Your own one-liner, you know, quick message, you can certainly ask us to do that as well. If there's something that kind of keys in and, uh, and there might be some time, um, that we actually straight up ask you for those, right? If anybody wants to, wants to have that kind of, uh, that kind of analyzed, if you will. So, but in the meantime, you know, like I said, if there's anything, if there's something specific that you want to know, if you can make better, how to make it more effective, you know, definitely, uh, again, use that Q and a section, um, to, uh, to, to ask that question. So, um, <clears throat> kicking things off here. Uh, so Dean, first things first, Let's define what we mean by message. So when we're talking about that and when we're when we're talking about what we're doing, I mean, what are we we're not talking about the iPhone text text, right? I mean, let's so, <laughs> well, so let's make sure right? right, right, yeah. So let's make sure that everyone that we're all here on the same page. When we talk about message, what are we talking about here? Yeah, so it's a great place to start. So when I say when I think about message, it's any content across any type of medium, whether it's um, articles, videos, presentations like this, anytime you put your brand out in front of somebody else, what is the message 
it's portraying. So it doesn't have to be just written. It could be your logo sends a message, right? So message is a pretty broad term, but most people tend to think in terms of the copy and content on their website. Maybe it's like their elevator pitch you mentioned earlier. Um, maybe you're trying to do video content. That's all message, right? It's all, it all contains the message of your, of your business, um, who you work with and the problems you try and solve. So message is a pretty broad term. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll get into content specifically as we kind of get through the conversation today. Right, right. And, you know, and that's, and that is a good, that's, that's kind of a, a key point here because our conversation is primarily going to be mostly about content, right? right. And about how to kind of create that content around um, or, or create a message around a, a coherent message using that content rather. Right. Um, so, but, but before we dive, before we jump into that, we hear a lot and I've heard from, an, and I've heard from a number of people, uh, you know, the medium is the message, the, or, or, you know, like if you're marketing on Instagram, you're very clearly telling me that you want this, that this is your expectation or something like that. How right. accurate is that? And how, you know, are there ways, are, are, how much do we have to be thinking about things like that as far as the delivery system for a message actually speaking for us in ways that maybe we don't want it to? Um, I think that the channel that you're using is important to consider as you build out your messaging, because, well, first of all, are you yelling into a, into a well, right? Is nobody down there? If you're selling to uh, business executives mid-market and you're using Instagram, you're probably not going to find those people hanging out there. And if they are, they're watching the kids, making sure the kids aren't doing anything they don't want them to do, right? <laughs> they're not there. They're not using that channel to connect, um, if you're on TikTok, same thing, right? So I think knowing who your target audience is, where they hang out online and offline is really, really important. So that would say that's sort of part one of your question. Part two is then how do you um, craft your message so it's the most relevant for that audience? Mm -hmm. So your content on, let's say, for example, so one of, one of my segments I go after are small business owners, right? And small is relative. It could be early stage and startup entrepreneurs. It could be business owners of, of organizations that are doing five to 50 million in revenue, right? Small is relative. So mm -hmm. let's say there's somewhere in the middle there. I, I use Instagram and I use LinkedIn as my sort of two social channels plus YouTube. And so I can use very similar content and messaging on Instagram as I do on YouTube, but it shows up differently. It's packaged differently. The way we produce that content is a little different, but the message at its core is the same. So I think you really need to keep those channels in mind. Sure. Excellent. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so again, kind of making sure that we're all on the same page, let's talk, can we talk, can you talk a little bit about how a good message actually helps to bring in new clients or prospects? Because, you know, a lot of small business owners here, marketing people talk about this. Oh, I, I craft your message to get you in front of the right people. Well, right. no, I get myself in front of the right people. You're just telling me the words to say, right? But there is something to that. And I know that. So kind of, so kind of talk a little bit about how, like how it actually may, how, how, how a good message gets you in front of those, the, helps you actually land those clients and, pro, and, and prospects. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. That's like the, the, you know, the $50,000 question, right? The, the how. So I think that there's all buyers go through a journey, right? We've heard, we've talked about the bias journey a lot on, on the community table. And so keeping in mind what the intention of your messaging is, is really important. And so um, there's a, uh, a, some really great people you can look up. Um, um, uh, Brandon Lacero is one that I really admire his way he approaches messaging and he has a whole that's his thing his messaging um, and he talks about the messaging ecosystem and the messaging messaging ecosystem is everywhere you have your messaging out in the world all the social channels online and offline and so once somebody's in your messaging ecosystem you want to move them through some kind of decision making process but he has a different type of messaging to get them in to the messaging ecosystem. So grabbing eyeballs online is a challenge, right? You've got to stop the scroll, stop the scroll going through any feed on any social channel. So your content to stop the scroll and get it into your messaging ecosystem may be a little different to what's in there, right? Because then you're trying to move them through a process. So you be really conscious of the purpose of the message, right? Or the purpose of that content. Having said that, there still needs to be that consistent thread of your stuff 
right? Mm -hmm. Your position, your opinion, your approach through all of your messaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much of our own personality to that point, how much of our own personality should really come through in our corporate messaging? I, I love that question because it's, it's so often people want to think that they're representing themselves and their brand. And when you read this stuff, it's like, really? Yeah. That's just the same old boring um, corporate blurb. I was looking at um, a company's website yesterday. They're in the um, IT telecom reselling like VoIP services and stuff. Mm -hmm. And their, their little pitch on their above the fold, the top of their homepage. As I read it, I thought, you know, you could take telecom out and put in any other professional service and it would be this, it would still be the same, right? Accounting or HR is like, that is not your personality, right? That is not going to set you apart. So I think that there's, you really have to inject your personality into your messaging and your brand, whether you're a, a solopreneur doing your own thing or you represent a larger corporation, mm -hmm. it's one way to set you apart. And really with, with the right kind of messaging, you're going to actually repel some people. Gary V, right? Well, maybe we'll use Gary V as a good example for a bunch of this. He is a good example for this. Right. <laughs> so Gary V, a Gary V is like a magnet, right? One side attracts and the other side repels. Right. And some people just cannot stand the guy. He uses profanity. Personally, I don't care. It doesn't matter. I, I, I actually like when you get past that whole persona, I really like a lot of the stuff he says. When I first started kind of watching stuff, I didn't care for his style. Mm -hmm. But he is a polarizing personality. So he attracts people that believe in him and believe mm -hmm. in his stuff. And so whether you're selling IT services or whatever the heck Gary's doing these days, right? I think you have to inject your own personality into it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the founder, if you're, if you're a slightly larger company, the founder's personality is already weaved into the sort of like the company brand because they created it. Mm -hmm. And so there's an opportunity to look at that uh, personality does that still reflect your current market and your current audience yeah and you know it's interesting because you know it, it kind of extending on this uh this the the gary v example right he's he's got like a wine brand now like winecellar.com or something like that yeah. right and you know i mean he may love wine. He may be, he may know everything that there is to know about wine. I love wine. I know a fair amount about wine. Right. But when I saw Gary V's picture on the homepage, yeah. it was an immediate clash because yeah. because I know him in a very specific way, like the, you know, like that polarizing individual. And I'm, you know, like to your point, yes, he's like, I think he's got a lot of good things to say. He's not my cup of tea personally. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of, there are certain there are certain reasons for that and you know but regardless right i mean it just is what it is right because again different strokes different folks you know we all kind of deal with the deal with things uh, react to these things differently right but when you end up in that like how are you so in an ex but in an example like that right i mean seeing gary v on this on this website was such a shot was such like a, a disconnect to me that i'm like well it can't be good i mean <laughs> Yeah, but, but right. it's probably going to be successful because that's what he does. He creates success for, for these companies. Right. But how, so how do you kind of, I don't know, how do you leverage that or how do you avoid that kind of collision that yeah. makes that repels people if you need to? Yeah, I think that's great. So he, a lot of people, well, some people don't know that he started out in the wine business. He started working in his father's liquor store as a kid, mm -hmm. as a young teenager and was one of the first YouTube channels I think it was called Wine Library or something. And he was just mm -hmm. reviewing wine. And this is a teenager <laughs> that really doesn't know anything about anything. And so that was like his beginning. So my guess is he's kind of coming back to some of his roots. Right. So if you're an avid Gary V follower and you know his backstory, it mm -hmm. makes some sense. Right. If you see Gary V out there talking about Bitcoin and all this other stuff that he's doing and media, there's this sort of like disconnect. Right. So either way, it's creating an emotional reaction and that's what you want with your messaging. You yeah. want to attract or you want to leave behind because mm -hmm. we all want to work with our ideal client, right? The people that are great, they pay us money, they're easy to work with, blah, blah, blah. Well, those people will be attracted by you and your personal stance on stuff because they relate to that. And if it's like Gary Vee is not for me, I'll never work with the guy and he probably wouldn't want to work with me, you know, because we're not a fit. Sure. So I think the more you can create a polarizing response in your messaging while that may sound controversial it actually will increase your 
uh, market share of the right kind of individuals to work with. Right. Absolutely. And, uh, and I mean, we've got a lot to cover today. And so I don't want to spend a ton of time yeah. talking about Gary Vee. But Chef Marion here actually um, uh, brought up a point that, you know, he's got us talking about him, you know, promoting him. And I, that I may, I mean, that promoting seems like it might be a bit of a liberal word for, for <laughs> what, what, we're, what we're doing here. But, you know, but he must, so he must be doing something right, like him or not. And, you know, I want to kind of, I want to to key in on that a little bit because yeah. there I think there's some validity to that but I also think that there's that that a lot of us think about uh, I remember having this conversation with my mom over and over again right about like a Snickers commercial or something that well she it's got you talking about it yeah but I'm not going to buy Snickers right I mean or well I mean I like Snickers but I mean because but, of that commercial right yeah right exactly you know it's it's not like it's not actually moving me it's not it's not messaging that's moving the needle in any way and you know to your point you know, you've like, he's got, he's, a, he, there are people that are going to be attracted to whatever he does, regardless, because they love him so much. Right. And, yeah. and the people that understand his backstory, I'm not one of them would, it would, it would align. It would, there would be a lot of alignment there, but then with someone like me who, you know, kind of would, would, would push away. Like I talk, I'll talk about Gary V, but I'm not going to, you know, but you know, again, it's not necessarily a promotional, conversation or, or what have you so is should we how much should we be focusing on that as we're kind of talking about what we put out in our messaging and what we push out in the world versus just saying you know what screw it i'm just going to be me yeah right and this is who i am take it yeah. or not and yeah. we can and then we're gonna we're and, and we'll go from there yeah i think that we all need to be a little braver mm -hmm. and and care a little less about what other people think and I'm talking to myself as well as everybody else here, right? Because, you know, with the old adage, people buy from people. Yeah. Right? Companies don't buy, individuals buy. I think that's still true, even in our digital automated world. And so mm -hmm. being a little braver, taking a stand for something you believe in, calling out the BS in your industry in a constructive way, providing alternative viewpoints is valuable. Because that's the messaging, that's the content that gets people into your messaging ecosystem, where then you can move them through maybe a transactional path. Mm -hmm. But if you're out there saying, if you're all you're producing is how-to content, which you and I both produce a lot of how-to content, sure. yeah. um, but if it's all how-to content all of the time, you don't stand out. Everybody, it's like the top 10 of this and the five ways to do that, and you're maybe you're a fitness a consultant and you're like the how to lose 10 pounds there's probably a hundred thousand videos or more of how to lose 10 pounds and they all look and sound the same mm -hmm. right and so you have to inject some personality you have to take a sometimes a counter viewpoint on content to get the eyeballs because that's the goal at the beginning of the journey is to get the eyeballs and get them into your uh, messaging ecosystem. So Chef Marion had never heard of Gary V, right? Yeah. Maybe she'll go and Google the guy. Right. He's got another follower. <clears throat> right. Who knows? Yeah. He, he's all about build, building his online, you know, uh, um, brand, his online presence right. and so on. That that serves his need. That serves his purpose. So I do think we have to be a little more um, willing to get out there. And when we get to the thought reversal topic a little in a little bit, we'll get into that because there's some specific ways you can do that. Yeah, that creates the attraction of the right kind of individuals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, to that point, you know, we talk about like thought leadership is something that we, we've talked a lot about um, kind of, that we talked, you and I talked about in preparation for this, uh, this session. Right. Um, and I feel like tr thought leadership has become a bit of a trite term. Yeah. Uh, like everybody's talking about it and that we're trying to be thought leaders. We want to do this. I mean, realistically speaking, is there, is there something worth exploring here? It still looks, it's still worth exploring or, you know, like, and, and what should we be thinking about as far as the way that we explore thought leadership uh, to, yeah. to get ourselves out there? Yeah. I, I still think that while it's an overused term, it, it feels overused because it's hard to become that thought leader. Right. Mm -hmm. How many more ways can we talk about messaging? How many more ways can we talk about CRMs and marketing automation? How many more ways can we talk about why? Whatever it is. So when you kind of you're looking at the same problem through the same lens, you don't stand out. Therefore, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily become a thought leader. And so why don't we just hop into the thought reversal yeah. kind of concept because it ties really well together. So let me sort of frame this up for you. Um, 
the thought of the purpose of thought reversal messaging is, is to get the person, your audience, your target buyer to think differently about how they need to solve their problem. Okay, that's the job. Right. And so one way to do that, one way to stand out, one way to sort of start to craft that message is to take a step back and think about what are the typical um, or the norms in your industry? Right? What are the norms in your industry that everybody in your industry just believes because it's been said for the last X number of years? Whatever that is, whatever that is. Um, and if you think about those norms, those beliefs, those sort of standards, if you will, you probably disagree with some of them, right? You can probably come up with a better way to solve that problem. And so you taking a stand on that norm and showing somebody a different way, opening their eyes to a different way to solve that problem, get them, gets them to rethink um, what they believe was true. And that's getting to reverse their thoughts, uh, thought reversal, right? Reverse their thoughts on what they thought was um, the standard. And again, Gary V, just because he's on top of mind right now, um, the norm, the standard in marketing is the more you produce how-to or educational content for your audience, the more they will believe you're a thought leader and an expert. Mm -hmm. Show me how to do this stuff and I'll believe you know your stuff. Is that true? Maybe, maybe not. You look at Gary Vee, he, he probably grew his online presence faster than anybody else in history. Mm -hmm. And he never does thought of, he never does um, how-to content. He never does educational content. Most of his content is about his beliefs, about his opinions, about um, guiding people and having sort of live conversations. He completely has changed the way we think about the messaging and how we become thought leaders. He doesn't do how-to content. He does so much of this thought reversal stuff. So I think that's something that we, we don't know enough about generally. And I think we need to spend more time there. So uh, if, if um, how-to content isn't the fastest way to grow your online presence, if that's your goal, then what is? So that's, that gets people saying, I want to know more. So if I produced content that talked about um, how-to content isn't the right content to grow your online audience, and my peeps out there that want to buy my stuff, want to grow their online presence, they're going to be in my ecosystem, right? They're going to start looking for more of my content because they want to know how. Mm -hmm. but then you have to have a story around how. Right. Right. So if you've got a, a process or a methodology or a belief, you need to give it a name. You probably have a process in your business. Everybody on the call today has a process in their business. And that process is probably a little different to the others that do similar things. Give your process a name and an identity. Right. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, the, I have a, a, some content that I'm building out. And it's called the Business Growth Blueprint. And it's really taking all of my 20 years of experience and knowledge of helping business owners build their business and putting it into a very structured deliverable, mm -hmm. business growth blueprint. So you're going to see in my content moving forward, a lot of discussion around the business growth blueprint. All of a sudden, it sounds real. It sounds credible. It sounds legit. It sounds like it's been there and it's proven. And if, if my intro to that is the way you've been told to grow your business is wrong, and here's why, using an example like a Gary Vee, for example. Mm -hmm. And then they say, well, how is, what? Well, how should I be doing this? The business growth blueprint is your how. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you've got attention. Right. So I may have gone off on a little bit of a, a rabbit trail there, but the point is, is that you've got to find something in your industry that's a belief or a norm that you can build on to show that it's not working. It's not true. It's outdated. And then come up with a fresh way to address that. Mm -hmm. That will attract the people in your audience that want to buy your stuff because they're so you are solving a problem for them they've not been able to solve for themselves. So it seems to me like the uh, you know again using Gary V that uh, that so a lot of his a lot of his focus is growing his brand just to grow his brand right is uh, is is for the purpose of growing his brand and then he can use that brand for other things like you know leveraging this or, or you know. The, building this wine company thing right mm -hmm. so <clears throat> for people that aren't just that aren't trying to kind of expand themselves out like that but rather just trying to be very focused and very intentional you know i mean the, uh with 
basically saying that, okay, so this is what I'm trying to build my brand for, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, there's a purpose for me building my brand. If I weren't trying to accomplish this, I would be perfectly happy staying over here with just my friends and family on Facebook and being okay Mm -hmm. with that, right? So for folks like that, though, you know, like thought reversal gets somebody to stop and get somebody to to pay attention. But it sounds to me like, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that at some point there still needs to be like a how to transition into that, right? Right. Yeah, that does. And you have to have um, your whole story, you know, crafted. Mm -hmm. And so if the thought reversal kind of gets them into your messaging world, into your online world, let's say, you have to then have content that starts to show what they need to do to change, to get a different result, not the how. And I think that's something that often gets confused at the what and the how. So let's say you want to learn to ride a bike. Easy example, right? If I say, here's what you need to do. You need to get a bike. You need to sit on the, on the saddle. You need to put your feet on the pedals. You need to push forward, point the handlebars, and start to pedal. Those are the what you need to do. But it doesn't say how. There's a lot more nuance to how to ride a bike. I can read the what to do online. Mm. I still can't ride a bike. Right. Right? I just know what the things are I need to do. And so that next level of messaging is the, the what you need to do. And so when, they, when your audience starts to see that path to achieving a goal, and if the what your methodology, your, your branded process is a little different, then they're going to want to know, well, how do I do that? How I do that is I work with you. So there's, there's logic to the sequence of information you provide. But it all starts with that thought reversal. And actually, I would say that it even starts before that. And we haven't really touched on this yet, which is your ideal client. Mm-hmm. Right? We've talked about ideal client profile and stuff like that before. But I would say with, when it comes to messaging, thinking about sort of this avatar, this, this person, this individual that will buy from you. And if you really understand that individual and the problems that you're trying to solve for them, you're going to use their language. You're going to speak to them as a person, not as a CEO of a company. Mm-hmm. That makes a yeah. huge difference in how you connect. So it's all sort of like, it's all part of this messaging continuum. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, I mean, how, how much, how deep do we need to go into like the demographic aspect of our ideal, per, our ideal uh, profile to really create messaging? I mean, do I need to know that, uh, that, you know, the average, that the typical avatar has three kids and, you know, lives with a white picket fence and, you know, all that sort of stuff, or, or can I just kind of get uh, how, how far beneath the surface do I have to go? Yeah. So I may be take a little bit of a controversial stand in the marketing world. And I say, I don't care about that stuff. Right now, if I'm big enterprise selling to big enterprise, that's a whole different thing. They've got millions of dollars to waste and whatever. They can test a bunch of stuff. But in the small business world, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. And so I care more about um, describing the individual. So a lot of us in business have are doing what we do because we've solved the problem for ourselves or we've solved that problem for our customers. And so in my world, if I go back 15, 16 years when I first started out in building my own business, and I think about as an entrepreneur, as a startup, what are the things I struggled with in generating revenue? Marketing stuff, messaging stuff, networking, selling. What are the things I struggle with as an individual? And is that the person that I want to sell to? Is that the person that's going to buy my stuff? If it is, I can speak firsthand to those challenges. Mm-hmm. Very empathetically. Now, if you're in a, in a business where you want that struggling individual, that avatar, find your ideal client that you've worked with, right? That person that you solved their problem, they were the sweet spot for you and create a description of that person. It doesn't have to be gender or age. It's more about the personal struggles and the business struggles. That that's, creates a much more powerful avatar than, you know, a female ages 35 to 55 with two kids and a Volvo in the driveway. Yeah, don't care. So I, can you kind of see the difference between a typical sort of like profile mm-hmm. and then like an avatar that really speaks to the individual? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So <clears throat> how many, you know, because you hear a lot when you're talking about messaging, you know, well, I can sell to anybody. 
right? And of course, you hear this, we hear this a lot with the ideal profile too, right? I mean, but I like anybody can buy my stuff. Yeah, but they're not, right? And so, I mean, we, but how many different profiles or avatars should we be focusing on? Because every, if I'm, if I'm hearing you right, every avatar needs to have its own messaging profile a lot, you know, uh, that, that you're going to pursue, right? Oh, yeah. So yeah. how many different avatars should we be focusing on as a business? Ideally one, at least to start with. You know, he's got such a unique product or service that really does speak to different market segments. And you're probably still solving the same type of problem, whether it's you're selling it to different verticals mm -hmm. um, or different size companies. You're probably at the core of what you deliver or value. You're probably solving the same kind of problem over and over again. So really just one. OK. Um, there's always caveats there. But generally speaking, if you can nail that one, mm -hmm. what it will make you do is niche down your business and your marketing and your sales and your products and your delivery to your, your most um, accessible and profitable market. Mm -hmm. uh, if you try and dilute, then you get dilution. Yeah. So, so going back to, you know, a point that you made before about, you know, once you have that thought reversal, you've got to have your kind of your story and your journey in place, you know, so I mean, when we when we talked about this, you know, before we were talking about the hero's journey, you know, kind of a deal. And, you know, so like, are there other things that we should, and I want to dive into that and kind of and, and hear, you know, kind of talk a little bit about the specifics of what those are, what that is. Right. Um, but are there other kind of messaging formats that we should be uh, that we should be focused that we should be looking into rather as well? Yeah, yeah. So I think with, with the avatar in mind, the other piece that's missing from that, which relates to your question is. This is the future person, the future situation. I'm, I'm sorry. This is the current person, the current situation. You also need to create an avatar of that future person as well. So it's like there's this concept of gap selling. There's a book out there by a guy named Keenan. He talks about gap selling. Current state, future state, same thing. Because you can speak to the current avatar so it relates, but you don't show them how and where they're going unless you have that future avatar. So that needs to be mixed into the message. So having said that, I think of messaging sort of in three or three or four chunks. There is the educational content, the sort of the what to do's, the tips and the tricks, that kind of stuff. I do think that's a lot of value because that can demonstrate expertise. It can show the possibility to your, your audience of solving that problem. But it shouldn't be 100% of your content. Maybe it's 50% of your content. That's probably a good mix. And then 25% of the content is um, the thought reversal, getting to think differently about the problem you can help them solve. And then the other 25% is, I guess I would call it credibility content or connection content. And that's the inspirational stuff. It's the storytelling. It's the um, um, using examples and case studies, telling about a client or a win. It's sort of like that's the content where we connect as people. Mm -hmm. So mixing those two up, 50% or three up, 50% of educational type content, 25% uh, thought reversal, 25% connection content, that forces you to think more than just writing a weekly article, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A weekly blog post or whatever. When you really try and keep that content mix alive, you have to think about different media. Mm -hmm. Webinars. Good example, yeah, right? Right. video and all the other stuff, infographics and, and images. And you, you get to sort of open up the creativity because not just writing that weekly blog post on one more thing that everybody else is writing on. Right, right. So, and that's, and I mean, this is stuff that can be used. I mean, because of course, every time people talk about content, everybody's brain nowadays goes to social media, but this is also stuff that can be used on the web. Uh, on, on your website, right? I mean, like these stories and kind of the connection content you're talking about, the, yeah. the thought reversal stuff. I mean, all that stuff can be used on, on your website and in, and in direct selling as well, right? Absolutely. You think about all the different ways your customer or your target customer interacts with you and your brand. Mm -hmm. It's not just social media. Like you said, all of those examples you gave are really good. It can be in a voicemail you leave. Mm -hmm. It can be in the greeting on your voicemail system in your business that everywhere anybody interacts with you you have to have that consistency in message um so you're continuing what do they say it takes at least eight or 12 exposures to a brand before we really understand what you do it's mm -hmm. re reality 
with these things and the messaging and the stuff we see every day, it's probably way more than that because yeah. we get close to thousands of mess marketing messages a day. So for all of those different types of messaging, all those different types of content, the different channels, you have to be consistent. So you have to have your messaging storyline really thought through. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So you talk, you, you mentioned the, in talking about the gap selling between the current avatar and the future state. So can you dive into that a little bit more? Um, you know, that's because I, and this is something that I've heard about too, in, in like course creation and selling your course is that, you know, you have to sell the, whatever they call it, like the, the, the magical transformation or the major, major adjustment or what, you know, whatever, I don't know. Like, you <laughs> right, gotta, right. yeah. So, I mean, whatever that is. Right. But it sounds like that's kind of what, like that future state is, is really what you're selling them on. You're just relating them to the relating to them using their current state. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah. So you get their attention by speaking to them in their language and you understand their problems by talking to their future state. Right. Mm -hmm. If, if I don't feel like you get me, I'm not going to pay attention. Right. If I hear generic stories or I hear, you know, standard old stuff, right. This is three ways to lose 10 pounds. I'm not going to pay any attention. Right. And so because I'm not talking to that individual, if it was if your current avatar is busy working moms with, um, you know, school age kids trying to lose that postpartum 10 pounds. Right. That's specific. Right. I'm going to see that and say, that's not for me. But, you know, uh, somebody else would say, that's me. I'm a working mom. I've got school age kids. I'm trying to lose that postpartum weight. Then all of a sudden, as a fitness expert, you've got a niche. You're speaking to that audience. Mm -hmm. Now they're like, how? How do I do that? How do I get there? What's the difference that you can make in my world? So then you speak to the future, the success, the, the how you get there, right? The, the what you need to do. And then I relate to that a lot more than just the generic 10-pound example. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got to really keep in mind the avatar and the, the struggle they're going through. And then with the future state, it's showing that possibility, right? I think people need to know it's possible, otherwise they won't ever begin. You know, online courses, we talked a little about that. I think the average um, sort of failure to complete the course ratio is like 80%. Because yeah. they, they, they've been sold the, the current state, this will solve the problem, but they, they're not convinced they can actually solve the problem. So they never stick with the course. Mm -hmm. whether you're providing a service or a product you've got to be able to show that end game in really clear fashion so i know where i'm headed yeah okay so let's talk a little bit about the hero's journey um because that is a big part of the story that uh, that we talk about right and i mean every hero has starts with the current state and ends in the future state right that's right yeah and that's right. the uh, yeah so i feel so i feel like that kind of that that is something that kind of encapsulates what we're talking about pretty well um so can you kind of dive into a little bit about what it is and what when what we mean by uh, by that yeah yeah you know, so i think it's a sort of a fascinating methodology and we've all been exposed to it thousands of times the hero's journey right so pick any pixar movie you like right pick any star wars movie pretty much pick any any movie with a hero which is pretty mm. much all of them and they all go through this same sort of journey this hero's journey it was developed many many decades ago but it was sort of brought back to life um when donald miller if you guys haven't um, heard of donald miller look him up he created this he wrote a book called The Story Brand, which is built on the hero's journey methodology. So all of the biggest blockbuster Hollywood movies have this hero's journey built in. And he, Donald Miller sort of breaks it down into seven pieces. So it starts with the hero, the hero that has a problem. They want to solve a problem. That's where it all begins. And in, in our world in marketing, the hero is not you, the person that helps solve the problem. The hero is your customer. They're the hero of the story. And sometimes a messaging gets flipped and we come in, you know, with the cape on the white horse. We're the hero. We're not the hero. We're the guide in the story. And so the hero's journey is there's a hero that has a problem and they meet a guide. They meet someone of influence, a mentor, someone like that. And that mentor, that guide provides them a roadmap to achieving their thing, a plan, right? And then they challenge them, they call them to action so that the hero will go on that journey and off they go on that journey and inevitably 
they meet failure. They hit a roadblock somewhere along the way, early in the story. And then the hero wants to stop and go home, blah, blah, blah. And the mentor, the guide says, no, you need to continue. And they do. And of course, then they get over that barrier and they find success. So that process is, is um, built on the hero's journey. But the story brand is like the revamped marketing version of that. So there's the seven steps. The hero has a problem, meets a guide, gives them a plan, causes them to take action. They hit some failure, then they achieve success. So hey, think about, it. like I said, any major movie you've watched recently, it's in there. Right. In some form or fashion, it's in there. And it's funny because it, it works with adults and it works with kids, right? The Pixar mm -hmm. movies, as I said earlier, the Toy Story movies are a perfect example. You can literally map out sort of scene by scene where they're at in the hero's journey. So having said all that, it's, um, it's a powerful uh, methodology because we, we're, we as humans have been exposed to that hero's journey thousands of times in movies and in books and in stories. And so we can relate to it. We don't feel lost through the journey we kind of know where it's going right we watch a movie we know the hero is going to succeed at some point in the time it's just the way it is it sells tickets so when we hear that when we use that structure in marketing messaging we relate to it we connect to it we want to kind of get to that next step in the in the journey so high level that's what the hero's journey or the story brand is all about okay so I'm thinking about the TV show Smallville, right? Which uh, was I was. It's uh, those of you who don't know. It's like the pre the pre story of Superman, right? I mean, from Clark Kent as a high school student all the way up through to you know all these other things. And you know, it occurs to me that that he had that. I mean, it was a ten season show, right? And so there were. It seemed like there were multiple stages of the this hero's journey. There was the you know him growing up and being guided or mentored by his parents to become, you know, to learn how to use all these things and become the man or the, the, you know, the graduate and the, the, and then there was that, the, the next part of the next part. So is this something that we can be using effectively in business? And I mean, and as an aside, that's also made me very concerned as a new parent, because now I've realized that I'm the mentor uh, which in, in this, in, in my child's hero's journey, which is terrifying, but that's a different conversation. You need to have a plan for him, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right. That's a whole different therapy session. But, um, but you know, as we kind of look at these types of things in our business, because obviously we want our clients to stay engaged with us, is this something that we can use in kind of in multiple stages to kind of keep getting them re-engaged and re-engaged and re-engaged? Yeah, you know, it's a really good point. And I guess I hadn't thought about it very much, but now you bring it up. I think it's it's it, the framework can be used over and over. So mm -hmm. use that framework to get them engaged in your brand and buying your stuff. But as the um, as as you because you understand that beginning state and you really understand the challenges and the journey they need to go through, you can anticipate other barriers, failures, right, in the just story along the way. So they buy your stuff, they implement your stuff. And you know there are going to be other um, impediments along the way. Yeah. And so you can use pieces of that additional hero's journey to get them to that next stage. Anticipate that next stage. So maybe you're going to roll out onto Mission Suite and they're gung-ho for 60 days and they don't do something else in the system that really sort of brings that usage of the platform to the next level. You can build some messaging sequences around, okay, you're 45 days in. You're probably experiencing this. How did he know I was experiencing that? Right. Um, here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to do it. So you can use that as a, you can use it for growing your accounts and selling more stuff. You can use it for um, account retention and growing the lifetime value. You can do it actually with overcoming sales objections too. You know, one of the best ways to sell is to deal with objections because, before they become immovable objects. The hero's journey methodology will help you with that too, because you can anticipate what they're going to say. Dive into that a little bit more. So if I'm if I'm a, a, a prospect of yours and, you know, like, and you know that there's probably some objections that I'm going to have because we all face the same, you know, we all in our bit when as in our sales processes, we all face the same questions over and over again. Right. Yeah. So you kind of know, like early on how to address those before. Oh, the U S you answered questions before I even, before I even <laughs> knew that they were a question. Like, well, I know that's yeah. not my first time. Right. But, right. But, but how do you like how do you apply the hero's journey to that to, to that kind of process specifically? How I like, I mean, do you, can you think of examples off the top of your head? You know, it's funny. I, I 
yeah, I can I, I can use one from this morning, actually, the timing. <laughs> right? So I was on a call with the prospect, CEO of a software company, very niche business. Um, and he, he found me on LinkedIn. He looked at my stuff and he saw I had some related experience. And he just wanted to know more about me and what our methodology is and how we do our thing. And so I was walking him through this process of current state, right? Been in business for X number of years, haven't been able to grow his revenue, haven't been able to figure out how to consistently create new leads and close new deals, shorten the sales cycle, the stuff that I talk about all the time. Mm-hmm. That was his current state. So we were talking about that and he was nodding. Yep, yep, yep. These are the things we're dealing with. And then we talked about future state goals and where he wants the business to be. And he has some fairly lofty goals, but in the interim, they're manageable goals. Mm-hmm. And so we talked about that future state. And so I asked him what's stopping him from getting from point A to point B. And so he kept sharing these different roadblocks. Um, and so one of the things I know he that became, that was an underlying um, objection that hadn't come up was competition. I've used people like you before and haven't got the results that everybody says they'll get for me. Mm-hmm. And so using this sort of hero's journey methodology, what I did is I, I showed him the plan verbally very high level here's how our approach is different a little bit of a thought reversal actually get him to think about his problem differently and it was a lot about aligning marketing and sales and he doesn't really understand his buyer personas and all this stuff right and his messaging really doesn't resonate and so he started to think about his journey differently so again a little bit of thought reversal a little bit of hero's journey um, and then i sort of gave him some ideas to think about and and I could tell he was thinking about the next step. And so he wanted to know what he needed to do to take action, which is one of the steps in the hero's journey. And taking action is for you and I to have another conversation and get deeper into this stuff. And so there was a little bit of a mix of approaches as I think about it. And then the, the, the last point I guess I'll make for that is um, he asked about competition. He named some specific names. And he allowed me to do a, a thought reversal with the competition as well because he thought these other companies did what i did because they will say the same kind of stuff right but i was able to flip the way he looked at what they did as it compared to what i do and he could see the contrast and then he's like okay that makes some sense now i understand why i've been looking at this problem this way and so trying to solve it with these kinds of service providers it hasn't worked yeah so Bringing this conversation back full circle, uh, you just said something that uh, that kind of triggered uh, triggered uh, something that we talked about in the beginning of this is that you know is the right messaging is going to help you to attract the right clients, the people that are that need exactly what you do and exactly the way that you do it, right? And then and and then repel kind of get away from the other ones, right? So. In thinking about that and in differentiating ourselves, because one of the things that we talk about in messaging and that every marketer talks about in messaging is you have to differentiate yourself from the competition, right? And the way that we all differentiate ourselves from the competition is that we've all got experience. We all we all focus on our customers. We all, you know, like we all have whatever, right? I mean, like all these, like these things that, that okay, yeah, you're, you're unique, just like the other 12 people next to you, right? So... In thinking about this and in thinking about ways that that truly differentiates the, the 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 competition and using the example that you just gave, should we be looking at the top five competitors that people think we compete with? And then basically, I mean, even if it's just into a voice recorder talking about this is how we were different. And using those as kind of some starting points for messaging and, you know, like, and, and then like, but, and then the course, the, the, the question comes, how do you get that into a, into a position where people look at it? Right. I mean, like where right. on the website does it go and things that, like those types of things, because it's yeah. not something you just blast out on an email newsletter. Hey, we're there. You know, this is something that we do differently. No one cares. Right. I mean, no until cares. they're looking for you. Right. Yeah. You know, I, Maybe maybe I'm controversial in some ways. I don't really care. This is about your thought reversal. <laughs> I don't care about my competition. I don't care about what they're doing. I need to be informed so I can say, here's how we're different. Mm-hmm. I don't care what they're doing. I don't care about the messaging. I don't care about any of that stuff. I want to spend more time understanding my avatar, my buyer, really understanding their psyche, what they're going through, the problems that we can help them solve. That's the first place. Second is, 
thinking about how you help solve that problem or how you can help solve that problem in a different way, right? And then how can you um, create a sort of a, a, a name or a brand around that, right? Your, your unique solution. Spend time there thinking about your, the problem you're trying to solve, where you're trying to get them to, right? How you do what you do in a different way. That's far more productive time spent as you think about. So in, in the brand story methodology, they call it a one-liner. It's the elevator pitch. It's the 30-second commercial. Um, create that. Get that dialed in because all of your messaging will be built from there. Now, is it set in stone? Of course not. It's not set in stone. It's always going to evolve over time as you get feedback from your market and your competition changes and your methodologies change and everything else. But spend some time on, um, on your one liner, your elevator pitch. And um, I think that's far better use of time than worrying about the competition. Because what happens is if you look at the competition, it biases the way you think about how you solve the problem. Right? It cannot do it. It's impossible to not have that happen. How do you mean? Because as soon as you, because they're all doing one thing, they're all doing a similar thing. It'll sound the same way. And it's so hard to break out of that sort of echo chamber once you're in it. I would rather you take a fresh look, a brand new perspective, try and find that industry norm, that standard thing that everybody says is real and the way it works and pick holes in that, mm -hmm. build your messaging around that, find a way, a methodology to deliver that Brandon Lucero, right? The messaging guy we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. He leads with, despite what all the marketing people say, how to an educational content want to help you build your online brand. Gary V, blah, blah, blah. He goes through the whole story. And then he says, we've created a methodology called the fault reversal to blah, blah, blah. If he just was out there reading all the other content guys' stuff, he would never have come up with that approach. Mm -hmm. So I would say get out of the echo chamber. You can always do some validation against it down the road, but you've got to almost like white blank sheet of paper. What is that thing I want to hang my hat on? Um, we both know a contract CFO in town, mm -hmm. and he spends a ton of time talking to business owners about um, cash flow management. Maybe a boring subject, but that's his thing, right? And how cash and cash flow are not the same thing. The way he talks about it is a little bit of a thought reversal. Business owners often think cash is the same as cash flow. Money in the checkbook is not cash flow. That's cash. Mm -hmm. You don't grow your business with cash. You grow your business with predictable cash flow. Sure. That's a little bit of a mini thought reversal in his world. He's not saying you need to have financial statements. You need to have this. Because everybody's saying that. He's talking about the difference between those two things. Right. So I would spend time there. Um, and we've got, I recognize a few of the names on the call today. And some of the folks are in um, highly competitive industries. I was going to ask about that. Yeah. And others are in more niche industries. And if you're in a niche industry, you've got a niche product or a service, it's a little easier to sort of carve your own lane, right? You're niche for a reason. You've got a unique way of doing things, or you do it for a very specific group of individuals. This becomes really important and more difficult when you're in a highly competitive industry. Real estate, I'll just use that, right? Uh, we see our good friend Doug on the on the phone here, on, on the call. Doug's in a really competitive industry in a crazy market right now. How can he differentiate from the competition? And he has some good messaging that he uses and he lives it. If I put Doug against a bunch of other realtors that I know, he just shows up differently. And so Doug's challenge is, how can you communicate how he shows up differently to a broad audience? But he has a persona about him. He has an approach that is uniquely Doug. When I think real estate, I think Doug. Mm -hmm. And I would the way I would communicate why Doug brings a ton of value, because I'm saying it with passion, has an impact on people. But when he says it, it's him talking about himself. Everybody says that. Right. Doug's challenge is to be able to come up with this one-liner, whatever you know, this elevator pitch that sets him apart. It doesn't sell houses. Right. People into their dream homes. I'm sure that's on everybody's real, you know, every real <laughs> website. But that's that's what he's doing, right? So you got to think about your your. You, are you in a niche business? If you're not in a niche business, you need to create a niche business in a, in the broader industry that you're in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I rambled there for yeah. a, a long, but yeah.
It's interesting because I, you, know, you just mentioned getting people into the dream home. And I feel like, you know, in this market, it's more important to, to say, we're going to get you into the stepping stone home, stepping stone home that's going to get you to your dream home eventually. Yeah. Right. <laughs> get you into a home, get you a yeah, right. Home. Exactly. Right. We'll get you somewhere that you can live with. And then eventually we'll talk about your dream home. But first of all, just get into a place. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's funny. Oh, man. That's great. But yeah, you know, and it's, and it's interesting because, and this kind of also goes back to the, to the conversation about the medium being the message. Because when I think of Doug, I think of handwritten notes. Right. And anybody that knows Doug, and if you don't know Doug, you should get to know him. Um, but, oh, so. uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but he, uh, you know, and that's, and, but that's the thing. Right. And that's, but to your point about he just shows up differently. Yeah. Right. That's, that's his thing. Right. And, um, He's one of the few people that 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 does that anymore, and it, and it works. It's effective, right? Because everybody that talks about Doug talks about handwritten notes, mm-hmm. and so it's uh, and so it's an it's an important thing to your and again to your point earlier, picking your thing that you want, that picking the way that you want to show up, and picking your thing that you want to hang your messaging hat on, so to speak, is seems to be what the important. So don't worry about distinguishing yourself from the competition, focus because you are internally, personally professionally different from the competition just in and of yourself right Absolutely. I mean, yeah. and so and it kind of goes back to the simon sinek you know start with why thing right the idea that if people if you can get on board with somebody on board with what you do they and i'm paraphrasing they'll, they'll stick with you until they can find something better if you can get them on board with how you do it they'll stick with you until they can find someone better but if you can get them on board with why you do it they'll walk barefoot through hell and back for you right totally Absolutely. that kind of a thing so if so because you are different figure out what you want to what you want to portray and and in your messaging and and use that and then let that be the differentiator don't worry about what everybody else is doing it is that what i'm hearing you say 100 percent, all day every day absolutely (laughs) you know this prospect this morning was asking me you know saying we've had other people come in and say this and say that and they've told me to change my website and send send more emails and we'll get more leads i'm like did I mention your? <laughs> did I? Yeah. <laughs> did I mention the, the 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 demo button on your website once? Did I mention the color of your website? Did I mention how many emails you send? No. I said because none of that matters, mm-hmm. right? I'm not the guy in your industry buying your stuff. So my difference is let's understand the buyer first, right? Let's let's talk to them. What a concept! Talk to the people that buy your stuff and figure out why they bought your stuff. Right. In this context. Talk to the people that know you, the people that have bought from you, the people that work for you, and ask them, what makes me different? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can create whatever question or questions you want, but get them to feed back to you. And then you, your job is to sit down and analyze those responses and find a pattern. If it's dog and handwritten notes, that's his thing. How can he build his persona and his messaging and the customer experience around this concept of handwritten notes? Mm-hmm. Handwritten note is what not, isn't what makes him different. It's the care and love and thoughtfulness behind the note that makes the difference. And that I think that's a really important sort of distinction is ask the people that around you that know you mm-hmm. that question. You will be surprised. I'm guaranteeing you if you get nothing from today, then that one tip, <laughs> it was worth the price of admission, right? right. Go ask yeah. people about what makes you different and why you, and what they think of when they see your stuff or they see you. Mm-hmm. Write it down and ask as many people as you can and then look for those, those threads. That's the beginning of your differentiation in the marketplace because you've already established it. You just haven't formalized it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, excellent. Well, and that answers the next question of, you know, if you could leave one, if you can leave everybody here with one, <laughs> with one thought, what would it be? There you <laughs> go, man. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, we are at, uh, at three o'clock here today. And uh, this has been a great conversation. Uh, um, it's, uh, I know that I've learned a lot and I hope that everybody else has enjoyed it as well. Um, if you, again, if you have any questions, if you're watching this, uh, you know, afterwards on Facebook or YouTube, uh, drop questions in the chat. If you have questions for us that you want, that we maybe didn't get to that you, that you want to, to circle back on, you can always shoot us an email or, uh, or again, go to YouTube and Facebook and, uh, and this will be there too. Um, Dean and I both share the YouTube link out for this, uh, to our LinkedIn profiles as well. So you can, you can connect with us both there. Um, Dean, is there any other place that you want to kind of let, let people know to, to, to check it out, to check you, your stuff out? 
you can find me on LinkedIn. Just search my name. You can go to Vantage Group Denver online. Just search that. I'm I'm easily available if you just Google my name. I'm around. I'm Perfect. easy to find. <laughs> I'm, you know, it's funny because with a name like Ian Campbell, I'm I'm significantly harder to find. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a regular Google search. So, you know, I never think to, I never think to just say that, but it's a good <laughs> point. Uh, so, well, excellent. Well, Dean, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all for being here. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you again next time around. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.